Let's take a brief look at the Wolf Pack DLC. This was the 10th paid heist pack released for Payday 2 and is a recreation, so to speak, of the one and only Wolf Pack DLC from Payday the Heist. I know, looking at Payday 2's past of content releases may make it hard to believe, but not counting the soundtrack, there was only a single paid DLC in Payday the Heist. It added two heists, the entire technician skill tree, a raised level cap, three weapons, and sentry guns. It was pretty crazy, to the point of basically being mandatory. Now, Payday 2 doesn't lock skills or deployables behind DLC, thankfully, but it hasn't shied away from paywalls for heists and weapons. And considering the sentry gun, strike pistol, and AK rifle were all base game items in Payday 2, and the GL40 was already added in the assault pack, all that was really left to add were the heists themselves, along with an entirely new weapon. It may seem strange to release a DLC for effectively the second time at full price, however, not only is this pack just another feature of Ultimate Edition now, but anyone who already owned Payday the Heist's Wolf Pack DLC are automatically granted the content in Payday 2 at no extra cost, meaning it's one of the full DLCs that can technically still be purchased on its own without buying the rest of Ultimate Edition. In a bit of a roundabout way, mind you. Regardless, let's check out the content provided in Payday 2, starting with the counterfeit heist. The crew makes their way to Florida after Bane hears talk of two men, Mitchell and Wilson, who got their hands on a counterfeit money printer. They haven't exactly been subtle, spending millions of dollars on fancy boats, decorations, and parties. Bane's plan is to steal the physical counterfeit plates and sell them off. Under the guise of Bodie's pool repair, you'll walk straight onto the property to meet Mitchell. Stay in casing mode, and he'll walk you down to the basement. Downstairs, he'll show you a big leak running down his wall from the intentionally shoddy piping we installed last time you were here. The water is running down around a security box. That's our target. Behind the secured door is the sub-basement where the money printer is kept. When you're ready, mask up and start hacking. Now, in Payday the Heist, the second you masked up, all the civilians in the map would become alerted, and you'd have to quickly tie them all down to keep the heist quiet. However, in Payday 2, it follows mostly standard stealth mechanics, so as long as you stay out of the way of civilians, they won't see you. After hacking the first box, a second box inside of Wilson's house next door will also require your attention. The basement doors are linked, so one can't be opened without also opening the other. Someone will have to sneak into Wilson's bar, find the hidden hallway behind the bookcase, and hack the second box. Now it's just a waiting game while the hack continues. Be careful though, because because if any civilian or player runs too far outside of the fenced-in part of the map, near the streets, neighbors will call the police and make the heist go loud. Even if you are perfectly stealthy, eventually a handful of beat cops will come to investigate a disturbance. One of them will always try to enter Wilson's basement, and if they see the hack, they'll become alerted. Take them out quietly, and you can stay in stealth for a while to let the hack proceed. While waiting, there is usually some loose bundles of cash and jewelry to pick up around the houses. Soon after, cops will call Wilson's house. If you're careful about it, you can actually answer the phone, contrasting the first game, and Bane will make up some excuse to convince the cops, poorly, that they had the wrong number. This plan of keeping the cops fooled only works for so long, and eventually the officers you had to dispose of in the basements will be reported as missing, and the SWAT team called in. This sort of partial stealth is a relic from Payday the Heist, where no heist was fully stealthable. It would always turn into a shootout in the end. If you decide to forego the stealth mechanics by letting civilians escape, firing loud weaponry, or doing anything of the sort that would alert the neighbors, things change a little bit. You still have to hack both boxes, same as normal, but assuming you haven't let Mitchell open the door to his basement for you, it'll be securely closed. You'll need a crowbar found lying around the map in various sheds or behind the pool to pry it open. You'll need that crowbar for the entire heist too, as once both electronic doors are unlocked and open, there will be gates between you and the secret basement housing the counterfeit money printer. Unless you brought the saw, which is a huge waste of a weapon slot on this heist, you'll need to utilize a crowbar to get through here as well. After all of the doors blocking your way have been busted through, there's still a potential obstacle. There's a chance the basement will be rigged with C4 charges that will prime the moment one of the gates is jimmied open. The game will scale the amount of C4 to the amount of players in the heist, so in theory you'll always have time to defuse all of the charges. But if you don't... It's a pretty violent explosion, destroying most of the basement and caving in the ceiling. There'll be a massive hole in the pool above, and below it is the pile of rubble formerly known as the money printer. Thankfully, that's not the main objective. No matter the state of the basement, the safe containing the money plates will remain intact, at least until we're done with it. This is a highly secure Franz Jaeger safe, and you can't simply drill the locks as we would for most safes. So Bane's plan is the old fill the safe with water and detonate a C4 charge inside strat, that I'm sure won't damage or scratch the fragile 
sell counterfeit plates in any irreversible way. I mean, counterfeiting is more art than science, after all. Place a drill on top of the safe to create a hole, where you'll shove a hose down. The hose can be found outside in a few different places. You'll need to drag it all the way down to the basement. If C4 detonated and left a gaping hole in the pool, well, it at least creates a faster path for the hose to take at the cost of cover. Most of this part of the heist you'll be residing in the basement, so cops will have to find their way down to you. Back in the first game, you were using a different kind of drill. While it never jammed, unlike in Payday 2, it required constant wall power, meaning cops, usually bulldozers, would try to slow you down by turning off powered electric boxes in the house or in the street. However, that mechanic has been altered in this iteration of the heist, so the drill is just like any other. And after it's done its job, you'll attach the hose to the newly formed hole atop the safe. Head outside and turn the hose on. You'll be able to see the safe filling up with water and bursting at the seams in a few places. However, this time around, cops will be able to do something about it. They can cut off the entire street's water supply at valves around the edge of the map. So you'll need to stay up top and defend the streets for this part, just like in the first game. Be careful of the ring of snipers that spawn on this map surrounding rooftops and the two or three SWAT turrets that will drive in, laying down fire on you from near every angle that isn't indoors. After all is said and done, the safe will be brimming with water. Prime a C4 charge and stand clear. The door will blast off, revealing many small diamonds for you to collect and the counterfeit money plates you're after. In the first game, this would be the end of the heist. You'd steal the plates, find a manhole, and escape through the sewers by prying the gates open with your crowbar and make your way to the beach. And you can still do that straight away if you want to. However, assuming the money printer is in one piece, Payday 2 gives you the option to start printing your own counterfeit money. It's not as valuable as real money as it can't be spent safely in most places, however, it still has enough value to give it a go if you fancy. You'll need ink and rolls of paper to fuel the printer, one of each can be found in the basement, and an infinite supply can be located at two boxes stashed around the map. Pry them open with your crowbar, and you've got yourself an infinite money-making heist a la cook-off, until your game crashes or whatever. In concept, this is a fantastic addition, and it really makes this heist stand out as a totally new take on counterfeit instead of just a port. However, the execution is flawed. It takes quite some time to simply print one bag, all the while cops will attempt to kill the power at boxes around the map, a repurposed mechanic from the first game that I mentioned earlier. If the power is killed, you'll have to restart it and the printer as well. In addition, cops can cancel the print for the machine itself, and the printer will constantly require more ink and paper to stay in operation. Babysitting this hunk of junk is one of the most tedious things in all of Payday 2. It's like if hacking open the server room on Big Oil was an entire heist. Never fear though, because once the printer finally grants you a bag of loot, Bile will take his sweet ass time to fly in and act as a temporary loot drop off, where you can secure the money for a grand total of 253k on death sentence. For comparison, that's nearly 100,000 less than a normal bag of money and only slightly more valuable than a bag of jewelry. And if you want to get really crazy, the meth you whip up on cook-off is worth 3 million per bag, and it's arguably far easier and faster to produce than this monopoly money. Frankly, while I appreciate the idea of the infinite money printing scheme this heist has to offer, it's just not worth it. It's not fun, it's not profitable, it's just a waste of time. So you're better off taking those plates out of the printer once the next bag is done, and skedaddling through the sewers at your earliest convenience. Considering the money printing segment is 100% optional, I wouldn't say it detracts from the heist at all. Overall, it's still a very fun, well-made map with plenty of practical cover, at least where it matters, and unique objective, just like in Payday the Heist. I would have liked to see full stealth added like they did with First World Bank and Diamond Iced, but the partial stealth mechanic is still handled very well. Even if you're a full team in Iron Man armor, so long as you control the civilians and tread carefully, using silent weapons or melee to dispose of the cops, you'll get a head start on this heist well before the SWAT even arrive. To top it off, the uncommon cinematic elements such as the C4 in the basement or a SWAT van crashing through Wilson's wall to create a new opening are ported over directly from the first game. Payday the Heist was very much quality over quantity when it came to its heists. There may have only been nine, but they were packed full of unique ideas and over-the-top RNG elements to have each playthrough feel unique. I'm not saying that Payday 2 doesn't have that, but places where it does feel very mechanical or are usually given so much focus that they become tired on repeat playthroughs. Either way, it's a damn fine heist indeed. How does the second heist in this DLC, Undercover, compare? Well, find that out and more right after the break. 
Welcome back, so heist number two. Heading back to the typical Washington DC location of Payday 2, Undercover starts the crew inside of an abandoned, rundown apartment building. You're spying on Mr. Stir, aka the taxman, as he tries to weasel his way into a get-rich-quick deal. He works for the IRS and plans to hand over a server that connects to an IRS bank account containing $25 million. While he does know the passcodes to get into the server, he doesn't have the means to extract the funds without being noticed, so he plans to pawn over the server server to some big, shady corporation. However, after learning about the transaction, Bane plans to intercept it. You'll have a computer, randomly placed somewhere in the apartment, hooked up and ready for the server. All you need to do is get it. While waiting for the buyers to show up and speak to the tax man, it's a good idea to set up some barricades. Strewn throughout the three floors and upon the roof will be planks. You can use these to board up fences to block gunfire, ventilation shafts to block enemy spawns, or windows to block both. You can also find some crowbars, but they're by no means required, and border line useless. Once enough time has passed, the buyers will show up. Once Taxman has confirmed they have the money, he'll head to his trunk and grab the IRS server. However, before he can complete the transaction, federal agents will jump out of every nook and cranny on the road below. Turns out it was a setup, and they've come to arrest the Taxman. He dives into the limo and locks himself up tight. At this point, a passing SWAT chopper will notice you on the roof, and stealth will come to a close. At any point before this, firing unsuppressed weapons will alert everyone in the street and start the heist early. I wouldn't recommend doing this too soon though, as if you get things going before the taxman takes the server out of the trunk, it'll make things harder for you later on. Regardless, Alex makes a return from the first game, taking control of a giant magnetic crane. Just as Bane had planned, albeit with a bit more gunfire than expected, Alex will lower the arm down and grab the limousine. He'll then raise it up, swing it back around, and deposit it atop the roof. The host player will be equipped with a mounted saw and have to head over to the limo and start cutting the taxman out. Be careful though, there's a chance that the roof will start to cave in from the added weight, and the limo will fall through. If that's the case, you'll need to shoot the wires to have the limo fall into the stairwell below, sometimes, uh, well below. There's also a chance the limo will never reach its mark to begin with, slamming into the side of the building and settling down on the balcony. Funny enough, if the limo quote-unquote successfully lands and stays on the roof, that's the worst case scenario. The roof has no cover except that which you make out of boards, broken easily by the barrage of enemies enemies, namely snipers. That may be what this heist is best known for, the constant, uninterrupted flood of snipers coating every vacant perch in the entire District of Columbia. It was arguably even worse in the first game, when snipers didn't have lasers and couldn't be highlighted. At least they're easier to pin down in the sequel, but no less lethal. When the limo is on the balcony or in the stairwell, you'll have plenty of cover from snipers, but not so much from the other hundreds of spawns inside the flats themselves. You can utilize explosive barrels, conveniently and inexplicably scattered around the map to make quick work of crowds or bulldozers. The SWAT have some explosives at their disposal as well. They'll prime C4 charges on select walls, giving life to new routes of attack at the expense of cover. No matter the state of the building, nor the location of the vehicle, hold out until the saw has cut a sizable hole in the roof of the limo. Yank the taxman out of his hiding place and ensure you snag the server along with him. If you started the heist early, before taxman stashed the server inside his shirt, it'll still be in the trunk. This is the one and only use for the crowbar in this map, to pry this trunk open, or else you'll have a lengthy lockpick between you and the server. Escort the taxman's server in tow through the hallways to the apartment where your computer rig is hooked up. If there's any cops in the way, you'll have to dispose of them, or else the taxman will refuse to move. Once in position, plug the server into the bank. This is where the fun begins. Take all your anger about tax season out on Mr. Stir here, bashing him over the head with whatever melee weapon you have handy. He'll climb up on the chair where you have to tie him up and start interrogating him. You need passwords for the IRS server, so scream at him until one of your heads falls off. If he's not cooperating, you can hit him again and again and again! Careful though, if you play too rough, he'll get all tuckered out and won't want to play anymore. <laughs> and you'll have to wait for him to wake up to interrogate him again. After he stops coughing up blood and starts coughing up codes, you'll be able to proceed. Input the code and defend the computer as Bane does the only thing he's good at. Cops will bust through the walls and hop through any windows or vents that aren't boarded up. They can shut down the hack at the computer itself or several power boxes strewn throughout the map. 
best hope they don't cut the power on the roof, overwatched by as many snipers as we have difficulties. Too many. After keeping the power running, or restarting the PC after a short, best hope you got a UPS on that rig, you'll need to torch interrogate Taxman again to get a passcode to hack the computer with, and then torturate him again, get another code, and hack the computer. This is more than a bit repetitive, but the hacks are decently swift, provided they don't cut the power all that often. A returning mechanic from the first game is if the power gets cut at the same time the hack completes, the game will softlock. It'll ask you to interrogate Taxman, but instead of asking him for codes, your character will just yell as if he's still being escorted. This hasn't been fixed, so try not to let that happen. Either way, after three hacks, Bane will have full access to the IRS account and transfer the $25 million over to his own account. Leave Stir in the loving embrace of the law and make your way to the far side of the roof. Shoot open the gate, round the corner, and jump the gap. If you're running dodge, this should be no problem. In a heavy armor build, though, if you're having trouble, there's an electric box you can jump on halfway across that'll make it easier. If you miss, you'll have to run back and try again. Once everyone is across, escape in the chopper. While much more straightforward and less varied than counterfeit, and absolutely the lesser heist of the two, undercover is still a great heist in its own right, even if you don't actually earn anywhere near 25 million. It may seem weird to see crowbars, power boxes, and boarding up windows or vents as such an important and centralized mechanic in both of these heists, when they're just sort of a thing that can happen on many heists in Payday 2. But keep in mind, these were new gameplay additions when this DLC was first added to Payday the Heist. Undercover in particular does a great job of giving you time to prepare your defenses, deciding what to board up and where to make this heist far easier for you and your crew. Do be careful though, as misplaced use of explosive weapons will make short work of any barricades. Speaking of, let's touch on the weapon this pack provides. The GL-40 was already part of the assault pack, but considering it was a secondary weapon in the first game, the China Puff 40mm secondary grenade launcher serves as an ample substitute. Anyone who's played one down pre-difficulty rebalance is likely familiar with this weapon, as for quite a long time it was the undisputed king of grenade launchers. With three rounds available prior to reload, damage aplenty to kill anything just short of a bulldozer, and concealment just high enough to function in a dodge build, there was truly nothing better. That is, until the weapon rebalance. The China Puff's damage was reduced by a fair amount down to its current 960. While you can still kill most enemies with ease, it does put some other grenade launchers in viable spots alongside it. The free compact 40mm is more concealed and deadly with less mag capacity, and the paid Arbiter is just the opposite. And of course, there's the dumpster fire of primary grenade launchers, but nobody cares about them. As the China Puff falls directly in the middle, does it make it the Goldilocks of grenade launchers? Honestly, no. It suffers from other intrinsic problems, specifically a lack of modifications, middling pickup rate, and very slow animation times. It takes a good second or so to even pull the weapon out, and what feels like an eternity to actually fire the damn thing once you've finished the reload. I would choose the Arbiter or Compact any day of the week over the China Buff myself, depending on the build I'm running. Don't get me wrong, it's not bad, but there are other weapons that do the same thing it does better. And besides, Grenade Launcher is simply aren't the dominating force of the meta like they used to be. Sniper rifles, armor-piercing rounds, shock and awe, and fully loaded ace are all viable options for dealing with shields and or groups of enemies, which by the way don't have nearly as much health as they used to. The China Puff's major advantages of being a high-damage, high-concealment grenade launcher that required no skills to function, which freed up points to spend on survival skills for higher difficulties, just don't ring as true as they once did. Overall, if you want a grenade launcher, I mean, it's a grenade launcher and a pretty good one at that. It's not like you're handicapping yourself just by bringing it, provided you avoid friendly fire. But it's no longer top tier, and there are other weapons that will do its job better depending on the build you're making. In that vein, the Pounder Nail Gun. I mean, despite its high damage, it's still a melee weapon in Payday 2 that doesn't stun, and it isn't the Ice Pick or the Katana. I will admit I love this weapon regardless, pumping nails into heads with a satisfying ka-chunk, but if I'm using this, it's just for the satisfying sound, as it's easily outclassed. Finally, are the standard standard four masks, Hans, the Dragon Head, the Viking, and Trickster Demon. Personally, I'm indifferent. None of these are anything I particularly care for, but that doesn't detract from the quality of the pack as a whole. Which brings me to my conclusion. There are actually two questions here worth asking. Was the Wolf Pack a good addition, being the obvious one? But if you don't have enough money for Ultimate Edition, and assuming you already own Payday the Heist, is it worth buying the $10 Payday the Heist DLC just for the standalone Payday 2 content? Well, that's gonna have to be a 
one no from me. It was a great DLC for the first game, but it also added far more content than the sequel's variant. I would only buy the Wolf Pack for Payday the Heist, for Payday the Heist, and merely view the additional Payday 2 content as a bonus for people who bought the Wolf Pack back when it was new, way before Payday 2 was even announced. Back to the point, just counting Payday 2, was the Wolf Pack a good addition? Absolutely, the China Puff is still a fun grenade launcher regardless of other launchers being better, and the heists themselves are cinematic unique ideas, not to mention plenty of solid walls and places to hide, making for far better cover than most heists produced by Payday Day 2. Let's be real, Pay to the Heist maps are way better than Pay Day 2 maps, at least in my eyes. Maybe you feel differently, let me know in the comments below. Anyways, any problems I have with this pack, glitches aside, do not detract from its value. Printing on counterfeit may be tedious, but it's entirely optional. Some may view the pseudo-stealth portions at the beginning of both heists as boring, but you can simply fire your weapon to get started whenever you want. I would have preferred to see counterfeit, or hell, even both heists made into fully stealthable ventures, but now thinking about it, they'd probably be rather easy in that case. Very few civilians, no pagers or cameras, so I understand keeping the pseudo-stealth as it was. Most of the other problems are intrinsic to Payday 2, such as heavy enemy spawns, SWAT turrets, or copious snipers. Those aren't issues localized to this DLC. However you may feel about charging full price for what you may see as the exact same DLC twice, especially considering the formerly overpowered state of the China Puff, now that Ultimate Edition is a thing, it's not really a problem anymore. More. All of this, and the fact that it's automatically granted to pay to the heist enthusiasts, I can't really call Wolfpack anything but a fantastic addition to the lineup. And now all we need is no mercy. And hey, if you liked the video, I'd appreciate it if you thought about subscribing. Either way, thanks for watching, and take it easy!